Okay, this is the second mini lecture on the Constitution. And in this one, we're going to talk about, well, we, me, myself, and I, I guess, but we're going to talk about the legislature, which is the subject of the first article of the Constitution. You'll also notice that it's the longest article of the Constitution because um, the founders were very concerned both about the power that the legislature could have, but also um, making sure that it's the most important branch, since it does, in essence, uh, represent the people. Now, what we decided on, or what they decided on, was a bicameral legislature, which means a two-house legislature. As you might remember, the um, states were arguing about uh, whether uh, representation should be based on the states or it should be based on population. Obviously, the bigger states wanted it based on population, whereas the smaller states wanted it based on states. And what they came up with was the Connecticut Compromise, which said that there would be two houses to Congress, and the upper house, or the Senate, would be represented by state, and the lower house, or the House of Representatives, would be um, represented by population. And the idea was that the House of Representatives would really represent the people, and so they would be elected to two-year terms, and um, be elected from individual districts that were uh, divided by population. So they essentially would more represent the people. The Senate would be elected for six-year terms, and so they wouldn't be quite as um, subject to the um, ebb and flow of politics the way that the House would, because they'd have to run every two years. Um, and there would be two senators per state, and this is also called the upper house of Congress, since it represents the states rather than the people. OK, so. Um, Here's some examples of, of how this works out. So in Colorado, we have two senators and seven representatives based on our, um, our population. And in fact, Colorado has grown in relation to the other states. And so in the last couple decades, uh, we've added representation. Montana, which is a very large state but has um, relatively few people, has two senators also, but it only has one representative because, again, there just aren't a lot of people. On the other hand, California, a very large state, has 53 representatives um, because it is that largest state, but still two senators. So no matter what the size of your state, you're going to have two senators, but the number of representatives you send to uh, Congress or the House of Representatives will depend on your population. And here we can see how this works in Colorado. So here's a map of Colorado and the different districts. And again, these districts are based on population. So you can see the 1st, 6th, and 7th district are all the, in Denver and the suburbs of Denver. The 2nd district is more up toward Boulder and um, even into parts of Larimer County, um, as, as well as some of the southern suburbs. Uh, the 3rd district is basically the western slope. The 4th district is the eastern plains. And the 5th district is a large part of the area surrounding Colorado Springs. And so you'll see that these are divided by population. Obviously, the big population center of Denver has quite a few uh, congressional districts associated with it, whereas vast areas of land with relatively little population um, represent districts of the same size, really, if, if you're looking at um, population. Now, here are some of the powers that um, these Congress people have. And this is in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. Um, the legislature, the Congress, has the legislative power. That is, they, um, they pass laws. Now, in order for something to become law, um, it has to pass both houses, and as we'll see later, it also has to be signed by the president or uh, dot, dot, dot. Um, I guess I'll leave you in suspense on this one, um, but there's more to that. Um, Congress also can collect taxes, pay debts, um, and this is really important because, as you'll recall, the Articles of Confederation uh, were weakened by the inability of the national government both to collect taxes and to pay the debts um, that we owed as a result of the Revolutionary War. It's also important to note that revenue bills, that is, bills that, that collect taxes, basically, have to originate in the House of Representatives. Since the House of Representatives represents the people, um, the idea is that taxes should come from the people's branch. 
Also, and this is very, very, very important, Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce. We'll see when we look at the expansion of the federal government that this has become a key part of the expansion of the federal government. This is called the Commerce Clause. More on this also later. Uh, Congress, Congress can regulate the naturalization process, the process whereby um, people become citizens of the United States. Congress can coin money, um, approve judges uh, to the federal um, judiciary that deals with federal law. Uh, Congress also has the power to declare war and um, the, the power and the mandate to support the military. Now we'll see then that when we talk about foreign policy, for example, even though the president, as we'll see as commander-in-chief, Congress still has a responsibility for funding the military and therefore has something to say about foreign policy and military policy. Another important clause that's also in Section 8 is the Necessary and Proper Clause. Basically, it says that Congress has the power, and I'm quoting now, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. All right, and so the per point of the necessary and proper clause is that it expands the power of Congress not just to what uh, the Constitution says it can do, but to anything that um, is related to those functions. And this has resulted, again, in an expansion of the powers of Congress and um, the federal government. Now, there are limits as well on the kinds of laws that Congress can make. Uh, Congress cannot suspend habeas corpus, that is the, the um, or at least the writ of habeas corpus, which requires that if you're um, held um, by the government, you need to be charged with something or be made aware of the charges, um, unless there is an invasion or rebellion. They wanted to be really um, careful about the um, situations for this. And so um, the only time that habeas corpus has been suspended in the United States has been um, the, during the Civil War under, um, under Lincoln. Uh, no ex post facto laws, so you can't make something, pass a law to say that something that happened before the last law was passed is illegal. And also no taxes on interstate commerce. And so if we manufacture something in Colorado, Congress can't tax tax it uh, moving into Utah or Nebraska. All right, and um, so basically these are the um, general powers of Congress and um, what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the executive power.